Welcome, Bankless Nation, back to the DevCon 6 experience. I hope you've been enjoying these interviews thus far. I hope they've been making you feel like you were on the ground at DevCon. Uh, it was a treat. In this interview, we're talking with Bartek. Bartek is the leader, the founder, co-founder of Layer 2 Beat. He's previously MakerDAO, and he is at the middle of the Layer 2 Wars. Uh, layer 2 B is this place where all of these Layer 2s are like indexed and documented about what holes they have, what they need to work on, and it's been like the sparring ground for all of these Layer 2s. So I get Bartek's perspective as what it's like to be in the middle of the Layer 2 wars and how he thinks the Layer 2 wars are progressing from here. And overall, are we as an Ethereum ecosystem, uh, Ethereum community members, not critical enough about our own Layer 2s? Are we hypocrites for... for critiquing cross layer one bridges, other alt layer ones, while also not looking at our own layer twos and seeing the holes and, and flaws in them as well. I asked him that question and more all about the layer two wars, the very, very spicy layer two wars. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Bartek from layer two beat right after we talked to some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. In all of my years in crypto, I've never been hacked, scammed or fished. And I owe a large part of that credit to my ledger hardware wallet or really my ledgers, like all of them, all five of them, because ledgers hold like 99% of my crypto assets. And it makes me feel good about self-custody private key management. You know what else makes me feel good? Using the Brave browser, the user-first browser for the Web3 age. The Brave browser keeps your digital footprint small, keeping you in the driver's seat, while also being a powerful battle station for Web3, letting you access your crypto through its native wallet or view your NFTs, or just keep up to date with the Web3 communities. And of course, you've heard of Arbitrum, and the Arbitrum ecosystem is really heating up. With their recent launch of Arbitrum from Nova, Arbitrum has entered the world of multi-chain layer twos. And with her recent acquisition of Prismatic Labs, Arbitrum Firepower is bigger than ever. Arbitrum Nitro shipped last month and has made Arbitrum faster and cheaper than ever. So make sure that you experience what Arbitrum has to offer before it's too late. But maybe you're a developer who hates the constraints of the EVM. So check out the Fuel VM from the Fuel Network, which has opened up the world of parallel transaction execution, breaking the Fuel Network free from the EVM baggage. With Fuel, you can leverage the Rust tooling ecosystem to build stronger apps, all while keeping Ethereum level security. And maybe you're on Arbitrum, but you want to get to Fuel. You might use something like Across, the layer two bridge from UMA. Across is a safe and secure bridge, making it easy to transfer your assets from one layer two to another or back to Ethereum. It's super fast, super cheap, and all secured by UMA's optimistic Oracle. And our last sponsor, Nexo, which has like five different products, and you're probably gonna be interested in at least one of them. First, you can buy crypto instantly with credit, debit, or bank transfer. It's also got an advanced trading platform called Nexo Pro. You can also earn interest on your crypto, your Bitcoin, your Ether, or whatever asset you like. It's also got an instant crypto line of credit with as low as 0% APR and a crypto-backed MasterCard. One of those things is probably what you want, so go check out Nexo, the financial hub for the digital age. And let's go ahead and get right into the interview right now. Bankless Nation, I'm here with Bartek, founder of Layer2B and also a co contributor at MakerDAO. And Bartek has found himself, I think, at the center of these Layer 2 wars. I wish there had been a ton of announcements uh, here at DevCon Bogota. Bartek, thank you for so much for coming on and joining me here. It's my pleasure. How, how have, you, have you been enjoying Colombia? Um, well, so far, so good. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, I like the country, and it's the mm -hmm. first time that I'm in Colombia, like probably most people, mm -hmm. uh, at DevCon. And uh, DevCon is always a great opportunity to see uh, other places mm -hmm. and cultures. Uh, and I really appreciate, you know, the, uh, the approach of the Human Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, where I feel like we're trying to include uh, mm -hmm. everybody, right? It's mm -hmm. not like just Europe and US and Europe and US, right, like most right, other right. conferences, but mm -hmm. uh, we actually you know, I've been to Japan, you know, we are here now. Mm -hmm. I'm truly wondering, you know, what's next? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly what's next with, uh, there's so many things that's next in Ethereum, and Layer 2 is definitely one of those things. Uh, you're, like I said, you are the uh, co-founder of Layer 2 Beat, which is this website that we go to to look at how many holes there are in the Layer 2 ecosystem. And uh, Vitalik, uh, recently at the roll-up day on Monday, uh, was giving a presentation as to all these different ways that we need to fix Layer 2s. Um, how do you think that progress is going, and are there any announcements that, announcements that you've seen here at DevCon Bogota that is working in that direction? So, um, well, frankly, uh, there are so many people that I talk to that, mm -hmm. you know, I don't like attend a lot of sessions. So I haven't seen a lot of announcements. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, having said that, uh, I think that most teams, uh, they uh, have presented uh, roadmaps, mm -hmm. uh, which are fully decentralized. You know, they promise all of us to shed the training wheels. Right. Um, and, and I think if we were to listen uh, to a uh, list on mm -hmm. L2P, just pure rollups, we probably mm -hmm. wouldn't uh, list 
literally anyone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be a very boring uh, website. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, you know, as it stands, every single project is very much centralized and mm -hmm. is very much controlled by, uh, by the team that actually created uh, mm -hmm. the rollups. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, with almost no exception, each one of them uh, has a roadmap, like a decentralized uh, decentralization roadmap. And and I think right now, you know, we're trying to uh, to kind of track the progress, if you like, right, mm -hmm. uh, right. and mm -hmm. made them transparent and mm -hmm. made them honest. Uh, and I think we're we're getting there for mm -hmm. sure. And one of the critiques that we've seen outside of the Ethereum space, and sometimes also inside of the Ethereum space, is that we're promoting these layer twos as if they're the magical, secure solution to scale a chain. Uh, but then we're also kind of hiding and pushing under the rug the fact that these have multi-sig bridge contracts and uh, we're missing fraud proofs. Do you think that the Ethereum community or the like, Ethereum promoters, maybe me and Ryan are guilty of this, are, are like hypocritical of, of the way that we kind of pitch layer twos? Or do you think there's a more nuance here? Uh, well, uh, this is a very loaded question. <laughs> here, right? So um, I'd say that you know every single team they've got their own agenda, mm -hmm. and some of them uh, are more let's say transparent than mm -hmm. the others. Some of them are hiding behind the marketing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone is, seems to be extremely keen at building the community, and. Uh, well, we cannot hide the fact that uh, it is a race, right? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it a war, and we don't know exactly how the future uh, of Layer 2 ecosystem on Ethereum will uh, look like. Mm -hmm. uh, are we going to see many different rollups, or maybe one will take, take it all? Uh, so that's still an open question in my mind. But if one team uh, sees the other team like uh, launching something which may have a lot of training wheels, you mm -hmm. know, they might actually be pressed uh, mm -hmm. to do the same. Um, and the general community, I think, uh, they don't see all these nuances because right. uh, they may not be published widely, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. we're not published at all. And this is why, you know, we essentially created this website so that we disclose some of these things uh, and we, uh, we just want uh, to make all these teams honest mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that the users actually understand all the security assumptions behind all these mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. You've talked about the roadmap that many of these layer two teams have presented to solve and fix some of these holes. How credible are these are these roadmaps? Are they legit roadmaps? There's real tech here, or, or is it more just hand waving? So that would probably differ. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, every single team has a, a little bit different approach. Mm -hmm. um, so if we uh, look at the optimistic rollups, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, we see two major teams mm -hmm. uh, putting a lot of work in, into actually making sure that all these fraud proof technology uh, is working and uh, EVM equivalent mm -hmm. uh, systems uh, will eventually be deployed. Uh, so I'm talking about Arbitrum and Optimism and we've got some other teams that are forking mainly Optimism code right. and they're kind of waiting uh, for Optimism to deliver the fraud proof system. Right. Uh, so you can see that you know some teams are innovating and some teams are trying to to, to sort of you know fork the code and maybe try to innovate on the edges. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mainly thinking about the Boba and Metis. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's optimistic uh, for the ZK. Um, most of the teams are innovating like crazy. I mean, mm -hmm. this is like amazing, really, to right. see the progress. Uh, I think we've all been surprised mm -hmm. about all these teams and. Uh, and well, Starknet, ZK Sync, Aztec, right? Scroll. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just just unbelievable. Polygon mm -hmm. as well. Um, everyone is like pushing code mm -hmm. really hard, and mm -hmm. every single conference that I go to, there's like new announcement, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, from either one of them. So, um, my understanding is that ZK Sync will launch very soon. Uh, Starknet is uh, just upgrading mm -hmm. to uh, version one. Uh, uh, of Cairo, which is like the major, major upgrade. Uh, the first version was very much centralized and wasn't particularly censorship resistant. Mm -hmm. um, we've pushed them really, really hard, you know, to work on this problem. And I believe that, you know, they uh, listen to the community uh, and the new version, which is like way more complicated, uh, will actually allow people to uh, to, to force transactions, you know, mm -hmm. to their system, right? right? So they cannot be censored. Uh -huh. I remember when I was reporting on ETHCC back in April of earlier this year, whenever that was, I can't remember how many months ago. Yeah, um, June, maybe. June something, July, yeah. Whatever. 
Yes. July, actually. Yeah, I think it yeah. was July. Yeah, July like, yeah. It keeps moving. You know, right, right, right. It was July. The, pe people are joking that the theme of the ECC was uh, the ZK EVM because so many right. people announced their ZK EVM. So it was it a test net or launch date or something? That also seems to be the theme of the roll-ups this week as well uh, here at, at DevCon Bogota where Polygon released their ZK EVM test net, Scroll released their ZK EVM test net, ZK Sync released their Layer 3 test net, and they have their main net in just like uh, 10, 20 days mm -hmm. here. Uh, and uh, also something that Vitalik said uh, in his presentation at Rollup Day was the ZK teams seem to be like the one part of like crypto building that has been massively accelerated beyond expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, going, you know, Ethereum, the merge was slow. Uh, sharding has been slow. But the ZK EVMs are here. Uh, when all of these main nets do come, like how, how, how big of a, first off, how big of a deal is that? And like, are they going to come and is it, is it going to be as big of a thing that people are excited for or is it still going to be like, okay, main net, but users are going to have to wait another, like, I don't know, six months to be able to do something. Like, overall, what's your take on the trajectory of the ZK ecosystem? Um, well, I mean, right now, um, we have to be able to sort of differentiate between systems that are ZK equivalent mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, let's say, ZK uh, or EVM equivalent or, mm -hmm. and EVM compatible. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, ZK Sync mm -hmm. uh, is a good example of you know ZK rollup uh, that is compatible uh, with EVM, uh, but this is not like equivalent system, mm -hmm. right? And I think we're going to see a very interesting competition uh, between systems that uh, try to emulate EVM as close as possible. Mm -hmm. and systems that will uh, prefer to uh, to make sure that the proving is like optimized uh, for the particular VM, right? Mm -hmm. And in this category, uh, I would put definitely ZK Sync and StarkNet. Mm -hmm. uh, so the competition between these two approaches uh, would be very interesting to watch. Um, having said that, uh, I think end users Probably for them, you know, it wouldn't really matter. Mm -hmm. uh, it might make a small difference for developers. Uh, but my thinking uh, about this is that uh, it doesn't matter so much, you know, how friendly this is for developers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's important that, you know, it's easy to port your code. It might be important to make sure that the, your code is secure. Uh, but for end users, uh, it's much more important that the system is fast, mm -hmm. it's cheap, right? right. Uh, it's got the big ecosystem uh, versus uh, good wallet support. And I think for, uh, to that end, you know, the account abstraction is like mm -hmm. super important. Right. Um, and uh, they won't see much of a difference, frankly, right? right? Uh, even today, when you're using, you know, StarkNet or, or Optimism or Arbitrum, I mean, you won't notice much of a difference. Right. So we're like debating the, 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 the details that most end users won't even notice, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it will come to uh, to the edges, I think, sure. uh, if something goes really wrong, mm -hmm. like uh, if one of these systems will start to censor, mm -hmm. uh, then end users will learn that there is a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then they will see that there are some systems that you know have working escape hatches, right. uh, whilst the, some uh, other systems don't have that facility, and suddenly your funds are stuck right. uh, because the uh, you know rollup operators decided to be I don't know off like compliant or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Pressed uh, pressed by the regulators. Mm -hmm. So um, so you know like for the daily usage, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the users will actually notice much. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's our responsibility to uh, educate them. Mm -hmm. uh, what are those security assumptions, right? Sure. Do you have your own personal opinion on the debate between ZK uh, or EVM equivalents versus EVM compatibility? Or are you saying both sides have strong arguments, let's let the best roll up win? Uh, I think both sides uh, presented very strong arguments. You know, mm -hmm. I uh, had the pleasure of moderating the panel mm -hmm. on the roll up day on that very topic, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I can see passionate, you know, statements from mm -hmm. both sides. So it will be extremely interesting to watch. Uh, and long term, um, maybe going ZKM equivalent, you know, makes sense. Uh, but you know, short term, uh, I think of uh, certain advantages right now mm -hmm. to uh, have a VM that's like ZK friendly sure. uh, because uh, it will allow you to do things faster and mm -hmm. cheaper, and and time to market uh, is likely to be uh, right. to be quicker, right? right. One of the things that uh, has been living rent-free in my brain, my, my brain, and the thing I've been trying to learn about the most here at, at, Dev, uh, at Dev, DevCon, 
DevCon, that one, not DevConnect, uh, is Optimism's bedrock. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see the modularity of Ethereum uh, find its way also into the layer twos. And that's really what Optimism bedrock is, is a modular layer twos in the same way that we have a modular layer one Ethereum. My, my mind here is that like what Optimism's bedrock is doing in the OP stack is that they're reducing the barrier to forking and producing a new layer two. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who has to manage a website, that is a, a registry of all the properties of all these layer twos, I'm slightly worried for you, Bartek, because what happens if you see a Cambrian explosion of optimistic roll-ups, mm -hmm. uh, layer threes? Do you see the same future as well? Or how do you think about managing all these proliferation of layer twos yeah, that might come? I mean, most definitely. And uh, even right now, the website is uh, hardly manageable. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there are certain inaccuracies and mistakes. And um, in, in future months, you know, the most of the engineering effort will go into automation. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at the end of the day, everything ends up on chain. And uh, we, uh, with our monitoring infrastructure, uh, once you know, it will be developed, uh, we will actually get all the information automatically from chain, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, there must be some registry of all these rollups. Uh, there will be a way to, to sort of read their configuration directly from blockchain. Uh, so hopefully, if they follow the same cookie cutter approach uh, mm -hmm. and like fork and create their own uh, rollup, it will be just a matter of, you know, having our bots uh, to read the data and uh, fill in the website. And then it will be, uh, a question of how to actually present it to user in a manageable mm -hmm. way, right? Which is, I guess, you know, a question for the UI designers. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'd say that today um, it used to be 80% of the effort uh, for the research and 20% of the effort for you know, like presenting all the information. Uh, but now it's going to be reversed almost, right? Mm -hmm. um, the automation infrastructure behind L2 Beats is going to be actually quite complex. Sure. Um, and um, tracking all the changes uh, will be possible because, you know, finally we've got some uh, fantastic tooling like the token flow insight. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the, uh, the, um, uh, the analytical uh, database that tracks every single state diff on Ethereum in all Ethereum history, right? Mm -hmm. So we can just watch particular slots and it will inform us, you know, what exactly happened and when it happened and uh, it will trigger um, warnings essentially right mm -hmm. so that's how i kind of uh, think about it i right. mean it, it has to be managed by by essentially automation sure and uh of course layer twos under the hood are extremely complicated i don't even know how to code so when something goes down i wouldn't know what to do mm -hmm. and so bartek what you're doing at layer 2b in my mind is just producing user sovereignty and tools that the individuals can use uh that are non-technical and very very helpful so thank you for everything you're doing at layer 2b and i hope you have a fantastic rest of your devcon okay thank you very much. Cheers. Bam.